Okay, that's the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, right now, I am just going to leave you in the capable hands of Professor Akhtar. He'll be taking over for me. I hope this webinar is as informative as he intended for it to be for you guys. I will see you at the next, uh, at the end of the session, brother. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. You may go ahead. Thank you very much, Shipiso. Uh, I'm sorry that um, you can't hear us, but anyway, uh, I hope the audience can. Can I keep on going ahead with um, with my presentation today? My presentation is uh, in a very uh, topical area. We've got so much renewable energies and and distributed energy in place, and and one of the things which is creating quite a bit of headache is integration of this to the grid. You understand that uh, it's not only for your own consumption, but also for the grid. So that, with that sort of small start, I would like to make a presentation of the whole thing and start with the customer, because you understand the customers and the customers are looking for more from their energy supply. They're concerned about the cost, they want choice and they want control. Three things, cost, choice, and control. All three Cs, choice, cost, and control. And this has become a huge challenge for the DNSP. DNSP stands for Distributed Network Services Provider. Because it, they can provide DSP. NSP can provide more choice and control, but they have to balance this against risk and affordability. The second challenge that they, they have to face is to proactively approach distributed generation and storage. If, if they want to integrate these two things, they have to be proactively approaching distributed generation and storage. And therefore, I would like to say that um, we have got a um, we have got an issue in our hand now, and that is um, we've got an issue in the hand. And before I start with the issues, I want to talk about the PV itself. My friend, the most important thing is that we are in the era of distributed energy where there is distributed generation where there is energy management where there is distributed storage and there is electric transport when we are talking about dgs there is integration of renewables and we want to do that because we want to maximize the benefit for energy and demand reduction we want to mitigate the barriers and issues that is the voltage and power quality so that we can enable customer connection at the distributed energy we want the to enable influence over policy and standards as far as the energy management is concerned we want to reduce our energy and peak demand we want to facilitate renewables and customer choice that is look at the load the control extend the life of aged and stressed network, mitigate the barriers so as to load the control, including the customer acceptance. As far as distributed storage is concerned, there's reduction in peak demand. Reliability is there. It is improved. Power quality is improved. And it facilitates renewables and customer choice. And on the top of that, it extends the life of aged and stressed network. As far as the transport is concerned, and we are looking at electric transport, you can gain knowledge of the use and the charging of EV. Charging is a very big issue. Mitigating the impacts of maximum, maximizing the opportunities. Boost network energy use without peak demand and influence public policy and standards. Therefore, the trends are such that um, uh, 
we we know that there is PV in our system, and PV is going to stay for a long period of time. PV is going to be there for a long period of time. For the residential solar PV, look at how much PV is there in the town. In, in Melbourne, where I am, and over here, there is practically, we are overstressed with the amount of PV that we have in the city of Melbourne. And uh, there is many people who are saying that a residential solar PV is past the tipping point. So see that it is past that tipping point. And, and everyone is, is going for this particular technology. PV diffusion, which has been modeled by our research organization indicates slower, but continued strong growth. In one of our state, in one of our state that we have, which is Queensland, there's $1 million of solar has been put in. So the national meter indicator is equivalent to the grid connection point and a commercial sub meter is equivalent to a commercial meter that is subsidiary to the connection point. And you see that how the penetration is impacting. This is according to two of our distribution companies who are showing you how there is exponential growth with distributed energy. Now, let us go ahead. Let us go ahead. Problem is, ah, let's go ahead. Okay. So there is an impact, and and if you look carefully, the impact is such that um, you can see that uh, in maximum time, which is the peak time, it, it there's a dip in the supply. So you can see all around, and this is a, a great picture where you can have a look at, at what the trends are at a power station when that duck curve comes, and you will see that there is no noticeable change in the peak demand but there is a valley there's a huge valley which is there which could have an adverse effect on asset distribution and utilization okay the trend and if you look at the trend we have got um, huge trend happening these days. And um, that trend which you see is in, in, in the pickup of lithium ion battery pack. And, and these prices, if you look at that, is constantly coming down, is constantly coming down. And the trend is that the prices of the electric vehicle battery, which is cost about 40% of the charge of the, of the cost of the electric vehicle is coming down dramatically and cost of electric vehicle has reduced substantially so you see that the trend towards is very favorable to distributed energy now my question is that that there is a <clears throat> there is a there is a whole system which is there and in fact there are two there are two bookends of the future one is what i call one is what i call the one which is um which is um the fixed cost one the one is the fixed cost one and the other is is basically the reduced cost one and both of this is causing a lot of pain and you will find that there is a there's a spiral in prices there's a cliff. It looks like the glasses is going to shatter. And, and that's all because of the, of the changes which is occurring. And you will find that the new utility businesses are emerging, regardless of whatever we do. And there is a, a great escape. There's a great escape, which may be good, but bad for many, more 
it is like robbing the poor and giving it to the rich this is what we call the 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 solar bonus etc and you find that there is limited market development and economic growth and there's significant customer or asset value at risk or or at loss so there is huge amount of pain happening if you do not do any reform and let's look at the other side which i told you earlier let's look at the other side when i mentioned about when i mentioned about reduce cost now in the reduce cost case there is again a greater market response a reform this capacity tariffs there is optimized der and there is a strong global economy the cost of the batteries are going down but this time is the other side of the book end the need to head is becoming an interconnection business so you need to get the market right you need to get the market signals right you need to find what are the incentives the the behaviors that will be that will be benefiting all you have to find what the new utilities are there because they are emerging but they have to be facilitated by the old ones more if not most are winners there are winners everywhere also you need to invest in customer not in the network invest in the customer that's what i keep on talking every time invest in the customer not in the network enable market enable market and economic development and you have to preserve your asset value that means not only yours but the customer or community asset value needs to be preserved so those are the other two bookends that i was talking to you about now let us see what is the implications of this on the distributed network and this is the platform that i am showing you i am showing you which is connecting all the buyers and sellers there is definitely a growth in in the der primarily it is in the mv and the lv segments now you are finding two way load flows which was not traditionally done in the control room of the low voltages you have to find who manages the power flow you have to look at the investment model because that is changing the focus is more on mv feeders and lv rather than the zone substation and sub transmission level network load control is unlikely to be dnsps in the future and the definition of a micro grid is now at the home at the street level at the lv segment at the mv segment no longer in the zone substation and sub zone substation so with that with that let us see some of the issues and let us see what are the what are the what are the key issues that we have the key distribution issues that we have and the one that i want to talk about is if you look carefully is you need to have a system where you can green the grid that means you need to provide technical assistance so that your energy system planners regulators and grid operators can overcome the challenges which is associated with integrating variable renewable energy to the grid and therefore if you look carefully you will see that now the trend is which is driving the technology and policy is looking at the dependency that means there is more dependency this is growing and people are requiring reliable supply you know that infrastructure is prone to fault infrastructure is prone to failure there is huge environmental requirement which is increasing day by day security concerns is rampant you're having it issues you have a cyber security problem you have 
you do not know how to protect your password. These are becoming a very big issue. And the climate vulnerability, whether it's al nino effect, al nano effect, I don't know what effects are there, but all these is becoming very difficult to manage. So we have got this issue that uh, the climate change is happening. And if you look carefully at the climate change which is happening, you will find that there is environmental regulations. There could be the price of gas is low. There's technology cost is declining. There's diversification. Public policies are changing. Financial incentives are being given. Customer demand is there. And new technologies and models are being used constantly. So in Australia, I would like to say that um, unlike the world that I gave you example of, our gas prices are increasing. Our consumption has decreased. The reason is that, as I mentioned, we have got so much PV panels at the top of our roof. We are not buying as much. I mean, I can only tell you my figures. I used to be paying in a month something like about $800 a month. Today, I'm paying about between $0 to $20 a month. That much difference. So the supply of electricity has gone. I'm not dependent on the grid. I use my own electricity. And you find that in many parts, especially in Victoria, our gas storage is depleting too, which makes it a very difficult proposition because our gas storage is coming down. And without gas development, electric, electricity prices are likely to increase, threatening the viability of vulnerable electrical loads. One more thing I have to mention that gas has now environmentally has been proven to be more dangerous than carbon. A small amount of gas producing nitrous oxide is more dangerous than the, the carbon that is coming from the fuel plant, fossil fuel plant. So there is a, a bit of an issue. There is a shortfall of energy. Uh, although the uh, utilities are not making much money as they were making before all these renewables came into play. The other issue which we are finding in Australia, as I'm talking about Australia context, we are having huge amount of issues with bushfires and power lines. And this is becoming a huge problem as far as adaptation of climate change, which is occurring. And we are having more frequent bushfires than we had before. So now you see everywhere around you, the sea level is rising, ocean acidification is there, right? And um, you're finding the global temperature is increasing. They're talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius. It is not reaching, they should get to one, 0.1 degrees Celsius is not happening. Extreme events are happening. You are finding low temperature, events decreasing since 1950. You find the Arctic sea age, ice are declining, glaciers are retreating. So there is less ice, less glaciers, less snow, and the ocean is warming up. So you can see that this has been happening not overnight. It has been happening for some period of time. So definitely we have got some issues with our hand and we need to understand that we have got very important two sources that we are using predominantly, not that there are other sources not available, but predominantly we are confined to, uh, to fundamentally two things and that is um, if you look carefully uh, with why we want to do this grid indication is because energy demand is there that is increasing we're having more urbanization climate change is happening we need to do grid modernization we need to have energy power systems that has characteristics that promotes integration of variable renewable energy. So grid 
integration is the practice of developing efficient ways to deliver high penetration level of variable renewable energy source. And look at all the, the, the huge amount of energy that we have in Central Australia. Uh, in the coastline is not that great, but we have to understand that Australia is a continent and renewable energy is variable. Therefore, we need to do a completely different type of power system planning. And there is where the evolution comes in because renewable energy is variable, uncertain, and geographically dispersed. As I said, look at in the case of Australia. So we have to raise the new consideration as far as planning and operation is concerned. We have to balance, which requires more flexibility. Our existing thermal assets are, are used less frequently. And slowly and steadily in Australia, we are closing our coal-fired plant. And this is affecting our cost recovery. We need to find more reserves. We do not have much reserves in Victoria, so we have to buy it from Queensland. Thank God we have got new reserves coming in Queensland. There are more transmission and better planning is needed. The present transmission is not applicable. We may have to go for HVDC system, which we have never done before. We have to look at voltage control, inertia response. That is another problem because the inertia response, you understand when you've got solar power, the inertia is very, very low. And therefore, most of our manufacturing will suffer. So this will be a very big issue. So with that, let us see what are the changes we are going to see. And there are three things which is going to happen. One is we will need to make energy. That means we have to go for more distributed supply. We have to look at, we have to look at accommodating this growth this huge growth which is happening. We have to move the energy. That means a new network has to come, which is flexible, which is reliable, which is resilient. And therefore, we need to have an increased visibility and control. And the third thing is we need to utilize or use this energy. That means integrate the end use activity and you need to empower the customer give power to the customer. So the technology that we will need to go for is energy storage, power electronics, distributed intelligence, adaptive protection, layered architecture, self-diagnostic healing, and data cipher and analytics. So analytics, data analytics is going to become the king. So then what happens is that, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, making this technology and, and how to make it. And I'm telling you right now, the solar prices are going down, okay? Industry solar prices are going down and more and more vehicles coming in, okay? So, so solar, solar is definitely is, a, is at parity. And if you look at it, it's coming down. And, and I can give you some of the example. The solar cost in the United States has sunk by 67% and in Japan by 85%. So these prices are going to go down further. And throughout the world, I've given you a picture where it shows you how the prices are shifting. Then <clears throat> what happens is uh, I'm, I'm going to look at the grid trends, OK? And um, if you look at it, the grid 10, um, we find that um, we need to move it. We move it from the old grid. Move it to a modern grid. Look at that. This was your traditional one directional flow old grid. Now you've got a bi-directional system where there is all your design needs to be changed your grid components and control components and systems need to be changed. 
So we are going from our good old old days to something of bi-directional or multi-directional, I could say. It's no longer the energy is flowing in one direction like we had in the old grid. Now look at that. Everywhere, there is at least a bi-directional or, as I said, multi-directional. So, so the challenge that we have, my friends, the challenge we have at the moment is to move with the central control. And to be very frank, it's becoming a nightmare. It's becoming a nightmare to manage this centrally. You have to look at multi-directional power flow, DER interconnection, dynamic operations. You have to balance the system, microgrids, and the swings of the wind, wild, sorry, wild voltage swings that is happening. I'll show you those voltage swings which is happening. And so the key is to find good distributed and intelligence that's already there. These are the, the closures which are there. Then there is um, then there is the pulse closures. These are the new types of things which has got two-way sensing, adaptive protection. Many of the things that I talked to you about is already there in the distributed intelligence as we talk about it. Okay. Then I said, make it, move it, and use it. So now we have got a situation where we have got all these emerging microgrids, okay? So this was our primary source. We have got new sources, which is the ordinary source, where we have got PV panels, we've got wind, and you name it, we've got all sorts of things. And this is our local community. And now the local community is also part because the distributed energy system, it is very close to the, to the load. So a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources with clearly defined electrical boundaries that acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable it so as to operate in both grid connected or island mode. You can run it in an island mode or you can run it in, in grid connection. Now, let us see what is the advantage of this microgrid. In the traditional utility model is changing to include standalone power systems, right? And, and uh, so we've got microgrid that has come in. The microgrid gives you the following thing. There's reliability becomes higher, as I mentioned. Resilient is also greater. Power is green. Infrastructure is modernized. The security is increased. There's cost saving. The price of energy goes down. Mitigation of bushfire. Then, you know, I mean, these are some of the things which is happening as we talk about it. And we can then see, and then we can see. And then we can see that um, the consideration that we have to consider, especially when we have DERs, is to look at inverter based because most of these are, I mentioned power electronics. So all of them are inverter based. So you're going to add more harmonics. Uh, it's intermittent in nature. There's nothing I can do. Wind and solar, wind is at the moodial. I call it the moodial generation. You don't have any control over the wind. You don't have any control over solar. You know, it, it, when there's sunlight, then you get solar. So you, it's very intermittent. So there is uncertainty over them. And therefore, if there is uncertainty in the input, there is uncertainty in the output. The, the codes are not properly done. So we need to, to solidify that. We have to be uh, capable that this is observed and dispatched. You have to have reliability as far as voltage support is concerned, frequency response is concerned, ramping is concerned. I told you about inertia because especially the bulk power operation and we have to safeguard against these attacks that I was talking to you about. Now, now we go to a bit on storage. There are three types of storage that we know of. 
the electrical one, the magnetic one, and the mechanical one. The electrical one are basically the electrolyte types of batteries, the lead, the lithium, ion, etc. The flow batteries, which are the vanadium, the redox, zinc bromide, etc. Capacitors and supercapacitors. Magnetic storage, which is a SMES type of system. The mechanical, which is the flywheels, the compressed air one, and the pumped hydro storage one. And now we we look at the background and and the justification and we are looking at from the new electricity generation context you understand there is a huge penetration i told you in melbourne is the highest level of penetration in the world for our per capita income it's a it's a small place compared to other big cities it's only the population is around six million okay but still we have the highest level of PV penetration in the world. And this is in, in Melbourne, it is mainly solar. But throughout the world, if you look at it, this renewable energy, which is predominantly wind and solar, OK, there's the highest penetration. And you have hydropower in Australia. Our hydropower is very limited and biomass. Uh, we, we have some. So the issue we have is we have to manage the intermittency of the wind and solar energy so that these resources that we have can be incorporated into the base load generation. And we have to manage the large load fluctuation. That means we are going to supply on peak consumption. The solution is very simple. Solution, store the energy. Everyone will tell you, have batteries. So you get energy from the renewable sources, from the grid in a form of recoverable as electrical energy and whenever required you use it we've had these issues before and now we are building everywhere wherever we have got all these renewables we are building 300 megawatts 500 megawatts battery storage plant but the constraint that we have is the technology especially the availability of the equipment and the life cycle of these the capital and the operating cost, that is losses, maintenances, and others. So, the benefits, benefits is, 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 is great. Benefits are great. We need to accommodate intermittent generation so that it can allow to operate at peak power and efficiency by storing the surpluses and whenever we need it, we take it. It has, the ability to dispatch energy during times of peak demand, peak load management, especially if there's no supply, especially if there's a weather problem like cyclone, typhoon, wind turbine has blown off, whatever has happened. Ability to supply peak demand locally and reduce transmission line demand so that you avoid the congestion on the transmission line. Ability to provide voltage support, voltage regulation, that is the voltage sag compensation, flicker, et cetera, and power factor correction. Ability to provide other ancillary services like frequency regulation, black start, reactive power. The possibility of islanded operation and ability to ab perform arbitrage on electricity prices, in particular, the electricity markets. So we see that um, uh, we see that we have the good benefits from these uh, batteries, okay? And and we are the landscape is such that we are progressing towards a, a very strong and smarter grid, and the storage technology is being evolved. So you see that uh, how the storage technology from the use of UPS is now going to load leveling, generation, and utilization. Exactly in the same manner, starting from uh, traditionally lithium ion batteries, we are going to all sorts of batteries. You're finding sodium based batteries, pumped hydro storage, and various types of batteries like the battery energy storage system, thermoelectric energy storage, compressed air energy system. All types of batteries are coming in. And it depends on the on the capacity of the system. So storage is very important, no doubt about it. 
and and you're doing this because you want to synchronize your uh, synchronize your your sources you want to have a smooth transition to and from the utility manage the intermittency minimize the reverse power flow and maintain voltage and store your output and release coincidentally with the local load so there is opportunities my friend there's no doubt about it the opportunities are there there's huge opportunities now we have got that although there are issues regulatory one is a very big issue ownership is the issue you have to redefine the roles advance the interoperability of everything capability for dynamic operation utilize lots of data you do not know what is a good data what is a bad data what is the ugly data so that is a huge that's why data analytics comes very important and you have to develop a workforce uh, competencies so you as a customer you as a customer now has to look at all sorts of things like bulk power system distribute op operation energy device form energy related services energy provider energy for financial services so you've got a you've got something which is uh, becoming a very big issue but there are i mean naturally with all these problems and challenges you're going to get uh, uh, opportunities also and the workforce is changing my friend the workforce is changing I, I always say that we don't need engineers of my age and my type my use by date is over my friend it is you the young ones you are the one you are the smarty ones you are the smart grid engineer you are the one who knows how to handle big data analytics system energy conversion public policy consumer behavior signal processing transmission and distribution energy engineering security marketing economics automatic control it standards power electronics computer engineering communication and believe me the traditional electrical engineer like me is outdated for the present need a, of the industry and that is what i'm trying to hint at and the education that we were giving to the electrical engineers is no longer viable in present time and on the top of that on the top of that we have to manage cyber security and resiliency nothing i can do about it this has become a, a norm these days that we are creating a cyber framework with accountability we have to create procedural path that parallels IT. And this is a mindset where there is a series of layered precaution, which is better than your firewall. So, um, so with that in mind, let us try and see, let us try and see how this integration can occur. Look, all this is the input, but I'm looking at the in energy hub i i call it the island of energy and and this is the mix of energy which is there and ultimately we get the output which is electricity heating or cooling so we need to integrate the sources of energy hub so um what happens is that once we do that we need to be very careful we have to have a proper integration and there's a case for more technology and intelligence therefore capacity factors of renewable require stronger transmission and look at all the various state that we sorry various countries various uh, technologies which are there and what sort of capacity factors are there okay and therefore if you want to look at the technical issues for renewables you have to look at the maturity of technology, network design, network operation, electrical protection, variety of technologies, connection cost, role of ICT has become very important. And continuing with that, you have to look at network connection uh, capacity, you have to look at power quality, reactive power and voltage control, especially the impact it has on weak system, reliability, benefit to security, islanding, safety. Unfortunately, if I have to go through one of them, it'll take me 
uh, at least six lectures to complete that this particular part. But I just wanted to give you an overall view of it. And hopefully, if some of you join us in our lectures, in our master's qual qualification that we do on renewable energies and integration that we do, I think you will get more value out of this. Then the technology, ma maturity of technology. If you find that maturity of technology, technology is still developing, my friend. Everyone will say that uh, uh, it's developed. It's not, my friend. Take my word for it. Everyone says we are a very smart grid. I can tell you right now it is not. You, they might be talking in, in terms of uh, particular stem of tree, but not the branches and all the other things. They might be talking on on overall in a transmission system, but not in the distribution system. We need to have more and better and improved technologies, newer ones to come in. Remember, power electronics is the key. And remember, when power electronics is there, we've got harmonics. So we are still looking for the magic bullet. There's many applications. We are still looking for storage. According to me, lithium iron, should not be used for the battery story. I think we should be using sodium batteries. Okay, so we have not come to that conclusion. Supercapacitors are beginning in new dimension. So there is there's a lot of opportunities for people to be looking at it. And if you look at the role of ICT, if you look at the role of ICT, that is becoming very important now because uh, this is happening all over the world. All over the world, we're having this. You need an optimum voltage control based on integral control of all the voltage controllable. You have to have, utilize this embedded generation as a renewable source via centralized uh, control. You have to do research on configuration of distribution system so you can utilize these uh, voltage control. Now, I wanted to do this flexible. I'll quickly go through this flexible power system because uh, I don't think I can complete this. But um, I, I just want to quickly go through a few slides on the flexible power systems. And if you look at it, when we are talking about the flexibility, when you talk about flexibility, it reflects not just the physical system. I'm talking about the institutional framework. And there are two sources. One is the physical power system, which is fundamentally your generators, transmission, storage, interconnection. But the institutional one, which is making the decision of dispatch closer to real time, closer to real time, we have to have better use of forecasting. We have to have better collaboration with neighbors. We have to have a power system operation we must carefully consider both the physical and the institutional system. So therefore, therefore, you find that your market will be dependent on physical system and the operation both together. So that smarter grid will require a, a very smart framework and a very smart market. So, and, and as I was telling you, they can this flexibility can address the grid integration problem if you have increase in variable generation as i'm showing you in this graph okay there's net load which is the demand that must be supplied by conventional generation unless renewable energy is deployed high flexibility employs the system can respond quickly to changes in the net load and we are finding that it can be done this is the ability of the power system to respond to a change in demand. And what we look at, if you look carefully, you find that uh, you have got a huge amount of flexibility. You can look at various type of economics of integration option that I've shown you here, starting from low capital cost op operation, which may require significant changes to the institutional context up to the option cost, which are system dependent and evolving over time. And um, you find that there are numerous options that I have. And with this 
numerous options that I have. Okay, I can increase my flexibility of any power system. The flexibility reflects not just the physical system, but remember I told you, it must also be the institutional framework. The cost will vary, but institutional changes may be among the least expensive. So you find that uh, if, if, if you look carefully, I would like to show you this particular graph, okay, where you can balance where you can balance uh, your be broader area, you know, uh, by just that variability and need for. So look at the at the variable supply. Instead of having that, have that much uh, number of of machine rather than having smaller number, and you see you have a much more stable system rather than a very variable system. Okay. Um, I just want to go to one slide if I if I'm allowed to do that. I, I know I'm going about I'm, I'm extending my friendship. I just want to go to one slide that I just want to give you one case study, and hopefully, uh, yeah. But uh, look at at the world how the how the support level of variable renewable energy is increasing, especially in Europe. If you look at that, but I wanted to give you one one example. Uh, if I can find it. Oh no, uh, I think I've missed it. Uh, there was a case study that I wanted to talk about, but um, I can't find it. Uh, yep, that, that is a case study I wanted to talk about. Just if you can give me two more minutes, uh, I think I'll finish this uh, with this, uh, with this uh, slide, with this slide. What I wanted to show you that wind can provide synthetic inertial control. Remember, I told you inertia control is a very big problem, and wind can do that. And it can do that, especially in the frequency response, whether it's the primary side or the secondary side. Wind can follow economic dispatch signals and can be incorporated into economic dispatch on market operations. And this is what has been tried in Colorado. And if you look at carefully at 2.45 p.m., Okay, the operator initiates curtailment in 300 megawatt due to the area control error. Look at the error became very high. That area became, and he used wind, controllable wind during that very high. And look at that, when it became low at 4 p.m., the operator initiated the AGC control. At that time, at that time, the ACE control stayed lower than 50%. So you see, the impact of wind can be operated. The I told you that there is inertial control is an issue, but that can be made. And that has been done and showed in Colorado, okay, that this can be done. So with that, uh, with that thing, uh, that was the, the slide that I do want to talk about. I just want to go through my takeaway for you. Wind and solar, is variable and uncertain. The experience from around the world have shown that 39% penetrations are possible. In Melbourne, we have got more than 50% penetration. This is the world's highest. Often, most of the cost-effective changes to the power systems are institutional changes. That means you do changes to system operation and market design. But specific backup generation is not required but additional reserve may be required, and that comes to the storage. Specific detail analysis will help identify the most cost-effective measures so that you can integrate this particular thing. So that, with that, I would like to just mention to you that um, uh, in summary, what I have told you today is that renewable energy has become a significant component of total energy. The cost is a challenge. But I tell you, the gap is closing. Sustainable energy movement is going through zero CO2 emission. Okay, How quickly they will come to, that's a question mark. European community are very, very uh, committed to this, and they are moving to a greater application of renewable energy. Mind you, China has become a great and a major player. Organization like Seagra is placing a lot of emphasis on this. this Technical challenges are real challenges, but I'll tell you one thing, 
the future is really bright for young engineers like you who are there to be able to see all these changes and be prepared for it. I can tell you right now, engineers like me are outdated, outmoded, and cannot handle for us this amount of control. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, Shupato, uh, I have finished my presentation. So you can go ahead, please. And there were so many questions I could answer. It. There were so many questions which are there. I think there are 113 questions. I can't answer them, but uh, we will try. And if you wish to send me the thing, I will definitely send an answer to that. Thank you very much. Shipiso, it's yours. Hi, Prof. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, it was a lovely presentation. I do hope that everyone enjoyed it. Uh, so I'm just going to move on from the next slide. Uh, I do believe that the professor will try and answer all the questions uh, that he or, that you have. Uh, he will be perhaps answering them in the chat box um, so that you are able to get the answers you're looking for. Any other questions, perhaps he will speak uh, that you will speak over the, the webinar session. I'm just going to move on to the next slide on my end. Uh, and I do believe that someone did ask in the chat box what courses we have that cover the renewable energies topic. So we have a professional certificate of competency in renewable energy systems. This is a three month short course that is available for anyone who has an interest uh, in the field. I do believe that some of you might actually be interested. That's the professional certificate in renewable energies, as well as the professional certificate in smart grids. Uh, you can find all of these accessible on the EIT website. I will be sure to uh, leave the link in the chat box, as well as my email, as some of you have been requesting for it uh, once I am through with my presentation. We also have an advanced diploma in applied electrical and renewable energies. Uh, that is a course that we also have. You would require about two years minimum work experience. The graduate certificate is also a postgraduate qualification. So you will need to have some form of uh, qualification in the field in order to actually start this course as well as work experience. And then lastly, it's the bachelor's in electrical engineering and the master's in electrical systems. So all, so the bachelor's and the master's are available on the website as well. Of course, they do have entry requirements that you will need to meet in order for you to be able to enroll. Okay, so those are the upcoming courses and the dates. Uh, they are available on the EIT website, as I've mentioned. I am going to send, uh, I'm going to put the EIT uh, website on the chat box. Uh, so that you are able to go on the schedule and see which course should be of interest to you. Okay, and these are all our upcoming webinars. We have one next week. Uh, you can see all the dates there available. You can go over on the website once more. That's the landing page for everything. Uh, there's several tabs up top uh, for the course schedule, how to apply, and then upcoming events that we will have at EIT. So you can go over on the website and actually register for those tech topics that will be available. Uh, just the last slide, I do believe, Okay, I do believe this is the most important one, uh, the one that everyone has been asking for, how to retrieve your digital certificate of attendance. So there is the QR code there. You can either scan the QR code or use the link provided. All right now, let me just copy the link so that I can leave it in the chat box for you guys. Okay. There we go. The link has been uh, posted in the chat box. It is the link qrco.de. Uh, you can see the rest of it. Click on the link and fill in the form to retrieve your certificate of attendance, please. Uh, if you're able to right now, well, because the slide is still uh, available on the screen, you can just scan that. It will take you directly to the same web form, and then you will be able you will be able to retrieve your certificate uh, from the, the link or the QR scan. 
Okay, so all of these will actually also be provided uh, within two business days on the emails that you registered for, they will be mailed to you. Uh, the cutoff date for you to retrieve your certificate as well as request for them is going to be the 12th of February and there is no time there. No further requests for the certificates will be accepted after the form has closed. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I am urging you, could you please actually just go over to the scan or the QR link and then you'll be able to retrieve your certificate. Uh, lastly, I do believe we are at the end of the session. That is the Q&A. Uh, Professor, I do believe you've been answering any questions uh, in the chat box. Anything yeah. else uh, from your end, if I may ask? Yeah, just a quick one I wanted to mention, and that is special. Some of them cannot click on that uh, code that you have given. Apparently, they're having some problems. There are 193 questions I've just counted. It's impossible to do it in this time, okay? But there's one or two that, that's come, especially there's a one very interesting one with three questions in it. They are asking about impact on, of bushfire, uh, how will gas supply uh, be, uh, be impacting the electricity market? And I do want to answer that question if I'm allowed to. Just two more minutes, I will take a, a super show if you don't mind. Um, so uh, the way it is, is that the gas supply, which is there is diminishing, but I'm not bothered about the gas supply diminishing. Gas is a, a bad thing nowadays. It's just a fossil fuel and slowly and steadily, whether you like it or not, is not only the, the thermal plant that you will get rid of, you will also get rid of the gas plant because the impact on health becomes very bad, especially in Melbourne where we are. We live on gas thing because all our heating is done through gas. It is the cheapest form of heating that we can find. We will have to redesign our houses and no more be dependent on, on gases. We'll have to bring in heat pumps, etc. It'll be a very hard thing. It'll be very hard. It's hard to change about uh, 2 million houses that we have in Melbourne and to make them congenial to what the climate change wants. Uh, the second question, which was there, was um, uh, was um, I, I, I was uh, this this was three questions that this person asked, and and I uh, bushfire. He asked about bushfire. Um, bushfire is a very predominant Australian issue in particular, but this happens to any places where there's huge countryside, and bushfire uh, can uh, uh, can uh, be a, a big deterrent to energy and losses of property, et cetera, happens every year in, in Australia. And we lose a lot of houses and, and, and there are a lot of things saying that these cables should be covered. This, all sorts of, of ridiculous type of suggestions has come in. Royal Commission has been said, we have not been able to solve this problem. So bushfire, uh, is is a very big problem, especially our which is in close proximity to our transmission line. Although there are uh, there are regulations which says that it's, if the bushes grow three meters in close proximity to transmission line, they should be chopped down. But it's not being followed due to whatever reasons it is, and therefore there are huge amount of bushfires. And we lose a lot of plantation and vegetation, especially in a country like Australia where we are dependent on our indigenous trees and plants. Uh, so th those were some of the questions that I could quickly think of, Shipushio. As I told you, if I have to answer every one of them uh, on this one, it will be difficult. But since you have got it in chat session, if you send it to me, I will try and answer as much as possible or try and combine some answers, and then you can send it to the audience. Is that all right, Shipushio? Hi, doctor. Uh, I've just uh, heard you, and I do believe uh, the attendees have as well heard you. Uh, no problem, we will do that. Uh, the EIT webinars team uh, will be in contact with you. Thank you very much, and thanks a lot to the audience. You have been great. Professor, you have been great. Unfortunately, you did not hear my lecture, which you are very lucky. All the others have heard, okay? But, but you did not hear my lecture. Uh, nuclear is not renewable. I want to make it clear that person was asked that.
nuclear is not renewable nuclear is is uh, is hardly has any emissions but it does not have it is not a renewable energy remember that uh, i think uh, with that i'll i'll close the session shipusho bye bye and thanks a lot everyone bye 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 from me thank you so much uh, professor actor it was a pleasure being your host today hopefully we can do this the next time thank you so much and have a lovely day sir bye bye Okay, everyone, that concludes our webinar for the day. Uh, I do hope that you join the next ones that we'll have. I did link uh, the EIT website there, I, as well as included a new link to retrieve your certificates from us. And then lastly, I also put my email address there. Uh, please send the mail to the email address. Uh, you also will have the EIT webinars email for any certificate related matters. Please use the EIT webinars email. Thank you so much. I will be stopping the recording. I will leave uh, the recording running for about uh, five more minutes. Uh, you can interact in the chat box uh, until that time. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending. Have a lovely day, everyone.